<laughs> so whether it's New York or Chicago, deep dish or thin crust, local or a national chain, or you're talking with John Bush and the students from the York Institute about toppings, the questions always existed of what is the perfect pizza? Now, just like PC when it comes to tacos, I just so happen to know a thing or two about pizza. Now, in fact, you could say, I'm a bit of a pizza expert. Yeah. Now, you might be wondering, how does one become a pizza expert? Well, there's several ways. You could study at an East Coast pizzeria, attend a culinary school, specialize in the doughy arts. You could study abroad in Italy, take in the fine cuisine. And though I don't recommend it to anyone, I do want to share with you my path to becoming a pizza expert. So here are my 10 steps. Step one, you have to have a love for pizza. Step two, after teaching for 10 years, start listening to the naysayers who doubt your ability to be an effective educator. Step three, develop extreme anxiety due to perceived underachieving. So you begin going into work early, staying even later, start neglecting your family responsibilities. Step four, even though student test scores improve and the program that you're leading is at an all-time high, you suffer from depression, from fear of failure and not making a difference in your students' lives. Step five, ignore all the warning signs that you're in a toxic environment, disregard your own mental health until you end up having a nervous breakdown in the middle of class and you run and hide in your car. Step six, continue in your denial for another year, all the while the very thought of even going into school causes panic attacks and you struggle to even get out of bed. Step seven, become completely demoralized about education. So two weeks before Christmas, you submit your letter of resignation with no intent of ever going back into a classroom again because you view education as broken and it broke you. Step eight, refuse help from any family or friends that see you're not doing well physically, mentally, or emotionally, and thus can't find any new employment. Step nine, hit rock bottom. With no employment, not taking care of your mental health and your physical health, you end up losing your home and your family has nowhere to live. And then step 10, have a former student reach out to you who is the manager of a local pizza place. He calls you up and says, hey, I don't understand what's going on in your life, but I see that you need help. You can come and work for me until you figure things out and get back on your feet. That moment, that phone call was a pivotal one in my life. I had a decision to make. I could either be humiliated about where my life was in that moment, or I could be humbled that a former student cared about me enough to make that call and offer help. I chose the latter. And that's how I began my journey on becoming a pizza expert. So it was a bit awkward at first because all the students that worked there, they were not my coworkers, but they used to be my students. Let me introduce you to Parker, Tanner, Stephanie, Shay, and Jana, all who spent time in my classroom. But after time, they stopped seeing me as their teacher. Soon I was just another coworker and eventually even a friend. As we continued to work numerous shifts together, I noticed that their conversations would often lead to discussions about the problems they were facing at school. They would talk about what they wished was different at school, what they wished teachers knew about them, how they would run a school if they were in charge. And though I had no intent of ever going back to a classroom again, I took all of their hopes, their dreams, those conversations, and I filed them away in the back of my mind. Now, when I agreed to take that job, I told myself that I was going to work hard. I was going to become the best employee that I could be. I had a supportive, caring, loving environment around me. I had amazing coworkers. I saw the power of team morale and what a difference that could make. I was a better version of myself because of the people around me. Soon, I was number one driver in the store. I had the best delivery times, led the team in sales. And though my family was clearly struggling financially, I was actually happy. And then another pivotal moment came when I went into work one day and my coworkers surprised me with an intervention. In the most loving way possible, these incredible people who I had grown to love, who helped pick me up when I was down, 
who loved me unconditionally. They told me I just simply didn't belong there. Now, I had grown quite comfortable working there. It was fun. I'd become a true pizza expert. I was even known for making custom orders. I was making pizzas for kids' parties, anniversaries, favorite football teams, favorite TV shows, movies. I was pretty good. <laughs> but then Tanner said something that made me see the world differently. When he said, just because you're useful doesn't mean you're in the right place. Now, this group of young people, far wise beyond their years, they told me I was needed back in the classroom. But before I could go back to education to help others, I had to help myself. I was still dealing with issues from post-traumatic stress, and it was about time that I sought professional help. Counseling and therapy works wonders. Asking for help is not a weakness. It's a strength that allows us to heal and become even stronger. I told my incredible wife, Melissa, who through all the struggles, the fear, the pain, the unknown, she stood by my side the whole time and never let go of my hand. In fact, we just celebrated our 25th anniversary on Tuesday. Shout out to the kids at Puyallup High School that celebrated with us at Medieval Times. So when I told her it was time I go back to education, she said, I know, I always knew you would when the time was right. Now, for those of you that are also a fortunate member of the I Married Up Club, when your partner gives you wise advice, you need to listen. Melissa told me to stop going to job interviews and start interviewing jobs. So I took that advice. At first, it was pretty easy because it wasn't exactly like schools were lining up to hire a homeless pizza delivery driver. But soon, I began interviewing more and more schools. And though I wanted to get back in a classroom so badly, I turned down job after job because it just wasn't the right fit for me. Because like the U2 song says, I still couldn't find what I'm looking for. But based on all those conversations that I had with those coworkers about schools while making pizzas, I knew I would find it someday, and I knew I would know what I was looking for when I found it. Now, you may be asking yourselves, how does a former teacher turned pizza expert end up on this stage talking about staff morale? Well, after interviewing school after school, I finally found what I was looking for, a renaissance school, this renaissance school in particular. Now, at the time, I didn't know what a Renaissance school was. I'd never heard of it. I had no clue what it was. All I knew was that the interview was different. The school was different. The staff was different. The principal was different. Everything at the Renaissance school was different from what I had experienced earlier in my educational career. And it was more like what my pizza place coworkers talked about what they wanted from a school. A school that focused on relationships, respected students' uniquenesses, and recognize their individual contributions to the community. A school that reinforced that teachers had value and placed focus on family and mental health. A school that reminded me of the reasons I became a teacher in the first place. A school that finally felt like home. As I got back to teaching, I still had some lingering issues from my past. I dealt with trauma responses to numerous situations, including my principal visiting my classroom. But over time, he built that trust that I needed. Now, previously, I didn't even know that you could like your principal, let alone become best of friends with him. And one day, he dropped in for a chat, and he asked me what new ideas I was planning on trying that semester. And I didn't understand the question because I was conditioned that you didn't just try new things. Ideas had to be approved. They had to be purchased. They had to be vetted from above. You didn't just try it because you felt like it. And then he taught me another valuable lesson. And he said, your past isn't something that happened to you. It happened for you. Use it, learn from it, but don't live in it. And then he asked me, what do you want your classroom to look like in six months? Who do you want your students to be in six months? To get them there, you often have to do something different. So knowing that I had his trust and his confidence, I told him what I wanted to do, 
And his response showed me exactly why the staff morale in that building was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. Simply said, go for it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, stop it. It's that simple. But you won't ever know unless you try. In that moment, he gave me permission to fail. Previously, I had only seen failure as a flaw which made me less valued, less of a human. But he taught me that failing was an essential step in the learning process. A principal who gives teachers permission to try, to fail, to learn, to improve also gives the teachers permission to do the same thing with their students. Now, teachers have often heard the old adage that students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, guess what? Teachers need that too. Far more powerful than trying to improve staff morale with a pizza party was knowing that my principal actually cared about me, that he believed in me when I was still struggling to believe in myself. That's how you improve staff morale. So after I went back to teaching, I had the opportunity to go back to the old town I used to live in, and I visited my former coworkers for some pizza. While I was there, I asked if I could deliver a pizza to Chris Wise. Now, coach Wise was the head football coach at the school that I used to work at. I delivered pizza to Coach's house every single week. Now, Coach Wise was a former college football lineman, six foot three, 350 pounds, and his kids were growing pretty quickly, so they ate a lot of pizza. So I delivered the pizza to him because I thought it would be fun to see him again. I knocked on the door, waited for him to answer, so I could see that surprised look on his face when he saw that it was me delivering. I handed him the pizzas, and I thanked him for being a loyal customer, for ordering every single week. He quickly set the boxes aside and grabbed me in the biggest bear hug of my life. And then in a moment that both watered my eyes and opened them to the fact that I was always surrounded by amazing people who loved and cared about me even when I couldn't see it. He put his hands on my shoulders and he looked me in the eyes and he said, it was never about the pizza. So if you truly want to change the staff morale at your school, before you give someone a piece of your mind, before you placate teachers and students by giving them a piece of pizza, if you really want to make a difference, be sure to give them a piece of your heart. Thank you.